I think everybody's heard the word concussion, but what actually is it? What is the diagnosis? How subjective versus objective is it? What are the criteria? So the word concussus literally translates from Latin to English to mean to shake violently. And if you think about your brain as like an egg yolk inside an eggshell, you know, the brain is, is, is inside this hard, you know, cavity. And if you have acceleration, deceleration, or translational forces that are hard enough, the brain's going to shift inside the skull. And that shifting of the skull is actually what causes concussion. Uh, when the brain moves inside the skull, the membrane to the neuron will stretch. And when that membrane stretches, this little, little chemical called potassium, which is supposed to be inside the neuron, will leak into the extracellular space. And when that does, there's an increased demand for glucose or energy that occurs due to the release of potassium. At the same time, there's an influx of calcium. So calcium leaks across that same stretch membrane, goes into the cell. And when calcium goes into the cell, we get vasoconstriction and decreased cerebral blood flow. So at the very t time the brain's demanding more energy due to the hyperglycolysis, we get an influx of calcium vasoconstriction and decreased cerebral blood flow and decreased energy supply. And so what concussion is, is a mismatch between demand and supply of energy to the cell. Hmm. Now, this is not enough to cause cell death, wall area and degeneration. There's no structural changes to the neuron. There's no death of the neuron but the cells struggle to operate at their normal efficiency. And we've now learned that when that energy problem happens, different systems in the brain can be de decompensated. And that decompensation of certain systems, we've now learned there's different types of concussions. There's actually six different types of problems we see following concussion. And that those different types of concussions help to determine how we treat the problem. So. As a clinician, my job is to find out where the aberrant signal is coming from and what system is decompensated. And then we have to apply the right treatment to the right problem. None of anything I just told you, we knew in 2000, none of it. And so we've now really learned a lot about how this injury occurs. We, we understand the pathophysiology fairly well, not completely well as animal model work that's been looked at with that. And we, more importantly, we now clinically know how to evaluate this injury in a way where we can kind of figure out what's happening and then apply a more targeted treatment to its, to its treatment. Now, one thing is, Peter, is that we don't have a biomarker right now for this injury. Mm -hmm. We don't, there's no blood test that's ready for prime time. There's no serum, serum marker. There's no imaging. This is not seen on MRI. It's not seen on PET scan. It's not seen on functional MRI. It's not seen on MRI. It's not seen on MEG. Uh, it's not seen on EEG. Um, there's no imaging studies right now that definitively help us with this diagnosis. And um, even we, CSF fluid, if you could access it, no. And we're doing that, but no. All those things are looked at. People are re very smart. People are looking into those things and researching it. But I do not have a biomarker to measure this injury. It's, it's at the cellular level. It's an energy crisis. There's no structural changes in the brain that we see following concussion. And everyone is like searching for that biomarker, but right now we just don't have it. And I don't see that happening in the foreseeable future. I mean, there's a lot of good work being done on it. There might be a panel of biomarkers that we look at, you know, but, and there's discussion of certain, certain, markers may help us, but no, at this point in time, there's nothing I would tell you that's ready for prime time. Just to go back to the beginning of this, so make sure I understand this. Um, yep. you, you have this, uh, movement of the brain relative to its, 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 uh, protection in the skull, the membrane of the neuron stretches. So presumably it's, you have a passive effusion of potassium out of the neuron Correct. as a result of that <laughs> is the, demand for glycolysis so that you can actively pump potassium back in against a gr unfavorable gradient? Correct. Okay. So that's why you need glucose, more ATP, force potassium back into where it doesn't want to go. And then tell me about the calcium. Why is the calcium, uh, is the calcium just following a gradient across the stretch, stretch membrane at that moment? Yeah, I don't know if we have an answer to that, but yes, that's my understanding of it. And when that pulse, when that calcium goes into the cell, you know, we get a vasoconstriction, decreased cerebral blood flow, and 
this is very clearly an energy crisis or what we call a metabolic mismatch that occurs to the cell. The important thing at this point is we don't feel the cells die from this. Um, it, they're just operating at a different level of efficiency. And what we literally see happen with this is different systems in the brain that require a lot of energy don't work as efficiently and they will literally decompensate from that energy problem. And that's given us some good understanding of how to kind of approach this injury. Actually, it's, it's, uh, we can get into the different problems we see from concussion, but yeah, it's, it's basically these systems that aren't working as efficiently as they should. How global versus focal is this type of injury? So if you have two injury, if you have two athletes, uh, and by the way, I think we're going to talk a lot about athletes, but the reality of it is you can get into a car accident and have the same injury. This so happens a lot more in non-athletes than it does athletes. Uh, yeah. But, you know, we use sports as a laboratory. It's a great petri dish to study this injury. Yeah. Um, but this applies to slip and falls, car accidents, all kinds of older people fall. And boy, that's a real problem that no one's really addressing. So keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so, so let's just say we took two individuals who at the macro level appear to have a very similar insult. Yep. Is this process occurring across the entire spectrum of neurons or could two people say, no, no, actually this is occurring far more in the temporal lobe in you and it's occurring more in the frontal lobe in you. And, and is it, uh, uh, clearly there's going to be a clinical diagnosis that's going to be required to differentiate that. But again, just at the pathophysiologic level, what's the, what's the diffusity of this? It's an interesting question. I wouldn't look at this as more like this affects the hippocampus or this affects the prefrontal gyrus or whatever. I wouldn't look at it that way. I'd look at this as it more affects systems in the brain and pathways mm. in the brain. And so there's really no known, like you get hit in the head here, you have this symptom. That's, mm -hmm. that's antiquated in terms of how we think about this. It's more systematically looking at how the brain's functioning. Okay. So now with that said, interestingly, we do see the posterior, when people hit the back of their head, you see mm. a very kind of specific presentation of problems from that that I can get into later. Okay. Um, but there's really no, like you hit your head this way, you have this problem. Rather, Peter, and this is important, concussion fights dirty. Like whatever you bring to the table that's weak seems to be affected more, 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 more generally in patients. In other words, there's pre-existing risk factors to have a worse outcome from this injury that will probably be quite surprising to hear for people. Um, and not only those risk factors, not only put you at more risk for less force causing concussion, but they tell you what kind of concussion you're likely to have if you do have a concussion. For example, mm. we talked about the, the different types of concussions. If you have a history of car sickness in your past, um, we've published a lot of data showing that those patients are more likely to get concussed and have a vestibular problem following concussion. If you have a history of laser- Sorry, just to make sure I understand that. Yep. They're more likely to get concussed or if they get concussed, they're more likely to have vestibular symptoms. Is it both? Both, okay. correct. Yeah, less force will cause injury in those patients. Um, wow. pa patients that have history of migraine, less force causes injury in this more, and you're gonna go down that migraine pathway. If you have a history of lazy eye or strabismus, um, you're going to go down the ocular pathway and yes, wow. less force causes injury. If you have a history of anxiety, you're going to go down that pathway uh, more ubiquitously. So there's almost a neuronal reserve thing here. You know, we talk yeah. about cognitive reserve and movement reserve when we think about Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease respectively. You're now talking about a concussive reserve. I, I think so. I don't know if I'd use those terms and I'm, I'm familiar with that terminology and it's been around for a long, long time. And I, I guess it sort of applies to this. Um, so researcher out of UCLA kind of coined that phrase, uh, cognitive reserve. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking, we can get in the weeds on that, but I, I would say, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're more vulnerable with these different risk factors and you're more likely to go down different pathways. And girls are more likely to have concussions than boys. Um, neck strength plays a role with that hormonal influences can play a role with that. Um, and we've also know that girls are six times more likely to have migraine and have car sickness in boys. And so they're more at risk for this, these problems. 60% of the girl of the patients that come through our clinic are female, 40% are male. 
the reason why is because they're a more vulnerable population and we see a lot longer outcomes in females than we do males because of some of those factors. Thank you.